Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this morning's GoFly Master Lecture. To kick us off, I'm going to pass it over to Gwen Leiter, CEO and founder of GoFly Prize, to get us started. Gwen? Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our next Master Lecture of the GoFly Prize. As you all know, GoFly is sponsored by Boeing. And in addition to Boeing, we are joined with our organizational partners around the world and are so pleased today with Boeing and our partners to be able to welcome Fernando Donez of Boeing. Fernando Donez's expertise in flight controls was developed over 37 years and in a career in making technical leadership uh, contributions on programs such as advanced digital optical control system the V-22, the Phantom Swift, the Bell Boeing 609, rotorcraft air crew systems concepts, airborne laboratory, and an adaptive vehicle management system. His contributions to these programs include system architectures, innovative safety monitors, redundancy management algorithms, FCS actuator servo loop approaches with safety monitors, and software architectures optimized for system safety and handling quality and performance. So his broad practical experience is complemented by deep technical understanding and the ability to explain complex concepts. And that makes him truly a sought after technical advisor and a celebrated mentor. And we are so very pleased to be able today to welcome Fernando and to be able to learn from him. So without further ado, we turn this over to Fernando Donis and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Gwen. A, uh, so um, uh, a, that, that was an interesting and complimentary uh, presentation. I'm humbled. A, uh, but let's start with this. I'm going to try to bring you some concepts a, uh, of, of safety and, and how to approach the design of flight critical systems within a vehicle such that a, uh, we, 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 we can actually take these concepts and bring them to the design of the GoFly a, uh, vehicle. A, a, um, with, with, with that, a, 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 I want to emphasize that a, a, I'm going to be addressing the 4.2.4 4 uh, aspects of the a, a rules, a, a, and specifically a, um, the, all, all the other aspects of the, of the safety approach for the design. Uh, so he, he, here are the, the aspects of the safety side. Uh, a, uh, that, that I'm going to be uh, presenting through, and, a, uh, and I, I want to emphasize these because these are the uh, areas that you're going to a, be graded on in for the competition. A, uh, and, and if these areas are not are, are not uh, developed uh, or, or are not presented uh, in terms of how you address each one of these, uh, then you will be um, you, you will not be graded as as, as you wish you you, you, you would be. Um, so with, with that, we will we'll start the evolution of, of flight controls a, uh, with an augmented, uh, a, before it was an augmented uh, flight control system, which is basically you have a stick and with uh, cranks and, and cables to a, to a service to control the, the aerodynamics of the vehicle. A, uh, and that developed into augmented systems in which the pilot would still uh, put its command, but it would have a, some uh, circuits that would measure the motion of the vehicle and make it a uh, more stable for for the pilot to 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 uh, to, to to evolve or, or to fly the airplane. With that, then digital computers came to to be and they started being used. Uh, we in in, in uh, Boeing Philadelphia have been doing flight control systems uh, since the 1970s. We did the, uh, the what we believe was the first a uh, um, fly by wire flight control system for a rotorcraft in in the late 70s. I joined the company in 81, and I, I worked on the first optical, digital optical flight controls, which using fiber optics a, uh, for commanding from, a, um, from the pilot and then get, and controlling the feedbacks with fiber optics as well, using the computers to the controllers. And what we're talking about in here is actually evolving a, for the future of flight of, of rotorcraft. A, uh, and, and that would be a theme that, that actually continues to, to go through. Um, system safety. Let, let's put the definition that's out there, and I, I, I presented what, how the military reads it, uh, uh, and, and I'm presenting here how the civil 
a, a, a SAE a, a ARP 4761 is the first document that is addressed when some when a safety engineer starts looking at the configuration of a vehicle and how it can actually do the safe system safety in accordance to this standard which uh, from from the military it says is the application of engineering and management principles criteria and techniques to optimize safety within the constraints of the operational effectiveness time and cost that basically addresses one of my points in engineering which is engineering is science plus economics and you have to address not only the operational effectiveness of what you want to do the time and the cost because that addresses the uh, the economics aspect of that, uh, and without the combination of both, you, you can end up with something that is so cheap and so fly, fragile that it doesn't get there, or, that, or something that's so expensive that nobody can afford it. Uh, and that means throughout the, all phases of the lifetime uh, cycle, and what that means is since the, since the instant that you actually be, uh, have a, a, an, an invention or a, or a design in your head, you begin to think about the safety of it. As an engineer, I've been trained, and I have actually been doing that for, for my entire 37 plus years, that I think of something, and before I can, if I look to see if my gut feel says whether it will work. If it says yes, before I begin to prove it with science, I don't go into the performance. I'm going, how can it fail? And then once I figure out that it can fail this way, this way, and that way, then I begin to say, can I mitigate those failures? And if the answer is yes, then I take the time to actually figure out performance and effectiveness. Uh, and that basically ha uh, can, can, can give you, you can actually do that in a very fast way. Uh, you don't have to actually spend uh, a, a, a months and years to actually develop that. You can actually make that quick assessment by some specific steps. The, the FAA and the civil thing looked at safety assessment as a systematic and comprehensive evaluation of the implemented system to show that the relevant requirements are met. The relevant requirements meaning the safety uh, with the performance. Uh, that is a definition out of ARP 4761. Uh, this is the first document that you actually look at. It is pretty thick and, uh, and, and, and it's interesting to read, uh, but sometimes hard to read. Uh, but a glance at some of the charts that is in there, it would be recommended. And after 4761, there's another document that is called ARP 4754, and that is the one that actually says how you actually do the, 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 the mitigation of the safety assessment, of the safety, of, of, the, of not the safety assessment, but of the, the, the mitigation of the potential failures that you could have. So the first step is to actually identify the hazard. I can tell you from experience that right off the way that there are in a rotorcraft there are three things that can actually get an airplane on the ground. You can you break the airplane and the, you break the fuselage of the structure of the vehicle and that will basically take the airplane to the ground. You can lose the dynamic systems being the blades or or, or the, uh, the the rotors that it has and, and the dynamic system and and that will make the system uncontrollable. A, uh, and the last one is, in, uh, is the, the, uh, the flight controls. If there is nothing to stabilize it, there is nothing to command it, it will actually go to the ground. So with that constraint or with that thinking, a, uh, we, the, the, uh, the structure guys already have a path to actually do that. They look at stress analysis, a margins of safety, a, uh, fatigue, and, and, and the life of the mission that you have to do. A, uh, and and then come up with 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 with, with those kind of um, with those kind of analysis. We are going to address. I'm going to address in this presentation how do you actually do the system safety for the systems of the vehicle. A, uh, then once you develop, what are the hazards that that, that you have? They said, what are the what are the failures that can actually make those hazards a, um, a uh, the critical hazards specifically the hazards that can actually bring like for example. A uh, uncontrollable, uh, uncommanded flight into in, in, into the uh, or a, uh, in, into the into the ground of loss of control. Those are hazards. And then how you, how do you lose of loss of how do you get to loss of control? Then you can not have command to the actuators, not have control loss. The computer went away, a, uh, and then you begin to actually address those by actually saying, okay, how can I make my computer that it doesn't fail or that the failure is is manageable? Uh, and that's where you begin to actually do the mitigation uh, that you do to actually make that 
Uh, and, uh, and then you actually go and test, uh, like do control and tracking or the validation of how you test those things, and eventually uh, you, you document what you have and what are the remaining risks so, so it is understood by both the designer and the user or what are the things that they have to uh, address. For like, for example, what information you have to put in front of the driver to actually say, ooh, there is something wrong in here, I need to land right away before it becomes worse. These documents present this table that basically is a way to, to measure what, what, what you have to do. If you end up with a, a, what's called an A1, which is a frequent a, uh, failure with a catastrophic effect, everything in red is in here is considered that you must address. So I would recommend that you use these kind of tables if that this, this table is in A4761 and, and it tells you how to use it and, and give you some recommendations. Uh, to actually address what do, how would I uh, address a failure uh, and on when do I address a failure? You know, if, if you can say I lost my landing gear. Well, maybe you can land without your landing gear. It's just has a little bit, uh, it, it's frequent, but it's the, it, the effect may be marginal or, or, or negligible and you may decide not to address it. So those, those are the things that you have to decide on the design that, that you do and then, the, and then say why do you decide not to address it and that, that checks the mark. Of the, of the evaluation. And then how do you define increase the uh, frequent probable occasional remote improbable? That basically is a matter of the reliability and that's where safety and reliability begin to get together because one doesn't necessarily drive the other. You can actually have a very safe system that all the algorithms detected and, and, and mitigate the failures and the a, uh, and, and you have a, a system of a, a, a design for safety that actually mitigates the, the, the safety, but if the software that is driving it or if the actual design that is driving it, a, uh, actually it, it, it fails every 10 minutes, then you, you, don't, you don't have a system. On the opposite, it's really, really, really a, a very, very a high reliability. You could send 10 to the minus 12 out of here, totally improbable. But it, uh, but but it's totally unsafe. The, the, system, the system doesn't doesn't look for any of the failures. It doesn't. You just go fly and you don't care what happens. The oil is down, electricity is uh, is got sparking or whatever. You still go fly. That's the problem. So you have to do a balance between safety and reliability, and that's what this this, this concept. By doing that, you have to understand the failure uh, of, of the failure rate, uh, which is how many how many failures are expected from that component. A, uh, per per flight hour, a, uh, and understand the environment in which those failures occur, a, uh, and and we'll go through that and the why you actually do that. I'm gonna bring a little bit of math in here, so a, uh, and it's basically about probabilities, a, uh, and it, it, it's to to actually do the reliability analysis of the system. The first thing that you have to to address is that you only have to address you should only address failures that are. Uh, let me put it a different way. This mathematics only works when the system is, is random. We're talking about motion distribution, uh, things that are not dependent on, on a failure that is not dependent on another failure. It has to be independent and random. Once you have the random probability of failure and declare that it's independent, then you can actually say, if you have, say, two, two components that you have, one can fail or the other one can fail, and either, either failure is a problem, then you add the probabilities of failures. If, the, if you have something like a, uh, they both have to happen, like for example, you may have two parallel rotors and they, they both actually do the same thrust and they both are capable to actually a, uh, control the vehicle. You can fail one and the other one will still be uh, good. So that a, uh, but if, you, if you fail also the second one, then now you don't have a pro then you have a problem. And when you have that kind of effect, then you multiply the probability of failures and, and driven by these uh, math ca calculations or easier by this Boolean algebra type, um, type, uh, type of thing. So here is kind of a graphical representation of how you use that Boolean algebra. How it, uh, it, you, just, just, you can Google Boolean algebra or, or Google a, uh, Sir George Bull, a, uh, the first Irish, mathemat Irish mathematician that invented this, this, this concept. Uh, and basically, so if the system is in series with this other, that you have, for example, the electrical system and the computer, 
so either if the electrical system fails or the uh, or, or the computer fails, you still fail everything. So you OR them. And when you OR them, you add them. And here is the add. When you have two systems, the one or the other can fail. Like, for example, you have a, 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 an egg thruster, a, and you can actually fail one and, and or fail the other, and you still, a, uh, you, you're still okay. Then you actually you, a, um, a, uh, multiply the probabilities by, by this notation. And I'll show an example of that could be. So here's a system that would have three a, uh, inertial navigation systems with a computer that that actually take all that data and stabilizes the airplane, and it has a uh, six rotors. Um, a, uh, and with that, a, uh, you, you have a single battery, and and you do that. So what what we encourage you to do? These numbers are sometimes hard to get, but if you actually Google in the internet and and and, and make assessments of where the data is and ask around, ask for help for it from engineers, a, uh, and, um, and and from manufacturers and you know, these day and age, you may get some, for example, electric motors or batteries that are made in China or in Europe, and they don't want to tell you what they are uh, or whatever. You may have to make a guess. A, uh, what may educate a guess is a, uh, the numbers that I'm using in here are conservative numbers that the uh, that, that I that I put in, both from finding things in the internet or from my own a, uh, experience. Um, so in here, to actually not have a a, an inertial navigation to, to not control, you have to lose all three of them before you don't have it. Because if you fail one, you still have two. If you fail two, you still have one. If you all three, you lost it. So if you lose this one computer, the whole thing is down because the one computer cannot tell the drivers where to tell the motors what to do. A, uh, and in here, it's, as a, as a, uh, as a, a uh, six systems, you, you need to... You, you can afford to actually lose two, and you still have four to control the vehicle. But the instant you you lose three, uh, you you uh, you actually control uh, you lose you, you lose control of the vehicle. So you have to uh, address a uh, wh what how many failures and what kind of failures you have, a, uh, and actually the failure of this with the failure of that because either this fails or that fails, a. Um, the, uh, uh, you, 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 you lost in control. There is one interesting thing that you have to also address within this concept. Assume that you have the same motor or the same driver or the same blade shaft. In that concept, you would have to say, in, under one condition, are these probabilities valid? Because if you actually expose it to an environment in which it's not designed to do, like, for example, you're driving it to maximum performance or beyond what it was designed for, and now you heat up the motor and cause it to fail, may, all the motors may be heated at the same time, and then now, now all of a sudden it's not a random failure anymore. You are driving through all of those motors to actually a, uh, fail, and, and you can actually have a total failure because of a common mode failure. A, um, so with, with that, this is the mathematics that you do. A, uh, I or the antennas and the IUs. I put, I, I added them together, so all three. Here is the computer. A, uh, here is the three rotors that I said, and, the, a, uh, and look at what this analysis said. Having a single computer basically drives the reliability of, of, of the entire thing. Having a single battery also drives the reliability. The, uh, of, of, of that entire thing. This 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 4 was trumped by the battery. And this 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus uh, 3 was trumped by, by, by the battery itself. If you fix that, now the next one is going to be the computer and etc. So this is a very quick analysis that you can do in things that are going to actually close your, your, your vehicle. Flight controls, the systems used to stabilize and control the airplane. If one of these systems has the high highest level of, of criticality, a, uh, and, and like I mentioned before, dynamic systems and the fuselage, and, uh, and, and be aware that if you actually look at uh, uh, using the, a, a, a totally all electric technology, a, uh, like I mentioned before in here, the electric system, including the wiring, actually rise to the highest level of criticality, which in a regular, a, 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 a fossil fuel type airplane, it does not. A, so you have to be aware of the technology that you're using, how to how the how you're architecting it, and where do you have to duplicate and and, and or over engineer, if you will, such that those failures don't don't occur. 
So in here, you have a flight control system with the mechanical system, the wiring, and the electrical thing. I, I am not going to talk about the controller design because that's a whole lecture by itself. Uh, and, and there is a lot of systems and computers that you can buy that have automated uh, uh, stabilization systems. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to do that and then experiment in, in, in how to do that. But what I'm, what, what I'm suggesting is that when you're looking at the flight controls, a, uh, with the electrical system, especially if you have a computer, and then the wiring architecture are the things that you have to address to make sure that that system, a critical system, does not fail. So here are the components that you must address a, uh, to do that, especially from a performance, because time delay between when you actually put the control and when the actuator moves so that the aircraft moves. It's a critical component of, of being able to be a, if you actually push and it takes three seconds to do that, and, the, and you're gonna say, where is it going? So you're gonna continue to actually push and push and push. By the time the command gets in there, it's gonna start accelerating like mad and you're gonna bring it back. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna create an oscillation called pilot-induced oscillation, which is re, or pilot-assisted oscillation, which is a, 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 a com combined uh, and, and, and uh, detrimented by the delay that you can actually put. Delay is one of your worst case things, when, uh, uh, components in, 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 uh, in, in this kind of thing. So here are my, my, my recommendations that when you're actually looking at the flight controls from the control sensors, the feedback sensors, the navigation planning, if, you, if it's not in here, and when you have circuit code and more circuits to drive the components, you need, you have to declare the requirements. Do I want this? What do I want the system to do to make sure that you focus your architecture and your design to what the requirements are? And it doesn't have to be pages and pages and pages. You just put something on a on a PowerPoint, paste it on, and always look at it to say, is this does this need what I'm trying to do? Define the reliability that you need to do. If you say, hey, I'm only going to fly for one hour, hey, uh, I'll design it for 100 hours. I'll just fly that one hour, and the chances of of that you can actually look in in Gaussian distribution tables. Of, what is, what is it that I got? Understand the failure modes of those components. We went through that. Define the system architecture and then begin to understand what the sensors and the signals are going through that architecture. Understand the dynamics of the vehicle. If something is very fast, you may need to actually do a faster control algorithms because of a, 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 the, the signal processing aspects of things. You, 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 if you have something that is that can actually fly at, at, at 20 hertz for your, your controller is at one hertz, you may not be able to control that. You have to be higher in bandwidth uh, to control a vehicle. A, uh, a, um, the controller has to be ba higher bandwidth than the bandwidth of the vehicle itself. So you need to understand what the vehicle does. Understand the power required for that so you don't over count, uh, over count it, but also understand the rate at which you actually can del deliver that power. Because if you put the thing, hey, I want to be in there, I want to I wanna push a... Uh, I, want to, I need to pitch right away, and you need the things within one second, the power within one second, and the, the system doesn't deliver it for five seconds, it's not going to do what you expect it to do. Understand heat dissipation. Heat addresses every single one of these components, including the electrical power. If they heat up, they are, you're outside of random failures, and now it begins to almost a guarantee to fail. Understand software. The software that's in here is critical. So find somebody that can either explain it to you, or, or that if you if you if you are fortunate enough that you understand software and how to actually make not spaghetti code and code that you can analyze, a, uh, how to go through that, that because it's not just control loss. Control loss may be just 30 to 40 percent of your of the code that you have in there. You also are looking at uh, in input outputs, how to actually detect a failure in a signal, how to tell how the navigation, all that kind of stuff is other things. A, and understand how to ask help for help. A, uh, to expect somebody to actually know all that, a, uh, it, it's hard. There are people that do, a, uh, so they exist out there. But please, a, uh, a, don't 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 assume that you must know everything that's included in here. A, uh, I, I added a chart and I told Gwen that I'm going to uh, share this presentation. You have it in here. A, uh, that this is how you actually a, uh, do a, a, an analysis of how of the delay that I talked to you about. There is a, a document that the Army put together called ADS-33, uh, Alpha Delta Sierra 33, that actually defines that if you have a, 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 a total delay between the sensor and the, com and the vehicle moving where you want it to move, and if that is be below 200 milliseconds, you are good from a stability point of view. Uh, and this is how you actually can define 
a, uh, a, a, a uh, the, uh, the, the, these are formulas that can actually give you like the, a, a, the analog to digital converter, you can actually say, this is my sampler and this is the number. Sampling time divided by two is the assumed a, uh, and, and, and this is the zero order hole that it actually a, uh, attaches to that. So this is how you actually a, um, calculate that. And with that, a, uh, that, that concludes my presentation, but it's the beginning of, a, of exciting fun for you and, and anybody that's actually designing of this. And, and, and I, I, I will include in my document this chart that actually is a, a, a list of documents and, a, and some of the key the, uh, charts that are in this uh, 4761 document that I talked to you about. Uh, and so you, you'll, you'll have that as a reference. And with that, I can um, provide any questions. Great. Thanks, Fernando. Um, so we've got a couple of quick questions here in already. If you've got a question, uh, feel free to type it into the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get through them. Uh, okay. So first question, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, wind tunnel testing to evaluate entries for low speed and high speed flight characteristics? Uh, absolutely. The, the, uh, the, the, flight, the, the wind tunnel testing is going to provide you first the loads of the airplane so it's going to give with respect to all the, uh, the, the fuselage and the thrusters and, and, the, and the controls if you are actually being piloted. With that, the, uh, you, you actually can get that criteria the, uh, to, for, for, for the structural side and the, and the mechanical controls that you may have. If you don't have a computer and you have mechanical controls, you, if, if the, the wind tunnel can give you what are the loads that are going to get back in into the, into the control and then decide what the kinematics need to be. Kinematics being the ratio of, of a, a position to position, one inch in here to three inches in the actuator or the blade that you need or the surface that you need to do, or the forces. You can have one force in heat, one one pound in my hand could be a thousand pounds in the in the uh, in the rotor. The wind tunnel will tell you that. The, in addition to that, to actually do the control laws, the wind tunnel you can actually do specific tests that you can actually look in the literature and and books. A um, like uh, a, uh, one of the best books that exist a, uh, to actually do that is is a book by uh, a uh, the late uh, Dan Proudy. A, uh, that's called Helicopter Performance, Stability, and Control. A, uh, and it's a book that I reference a lot. A, uh, and it's a good source, but there's many others in the, in the thing. What you get out of the wind tunnel from that is the stability derivatives, a, uh, which basically says, hey, if I'm pushing forward, how, how many degrees or, or a second I'm going to through? A, uh, if I push forward, is the, is the airplane going to take me back? And you can, you, you can actually get a, uh, a, a parameters that will tell you whether the system is inherently stable in a specific axis or if it's inherently beyond stable. A lot of the axes in a helicopter, a, uh, especially in a single rotor, are unstable. In multi-rotors, because you're summing the, the, the you're doing summation of, of, uh, of, the, a, of the moment a, uh, to actually control can, can actually be stable, but the wind tunnel testing will give you the stability to the rotors, and then you can use to actually do the control loss, and you can use then find a controls engineer or, or buy a book or go in and then try to do searches on the internet. So that a, that's a little bit more a, a risky. A, uh, that explains to you how to use those stability derivatives to design the control loss that you need to to do, or it may decide that your airplane is totally stable. You don't need any of that fancy software or controllability. Is one of the other benefits that you can get out of a wind tunnel. Wind tunnels can be expensive, but if you can find a way to actually do it cheap, it will give you a great risk mitigating step into achieving success. Great, thanks. Uh, and you've talked a, a bit about um, using computers and electronics for flight controls. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, more analog systems and what effect latencies and delays might be as part of those type systems? Yes. A, uh, so, so that I think that's an interesting point because the, with, with with the use of computers comes some flexibility, but some a a, a, um, a detriment. And one of the detriments is the is is is, is the is the um, delays that it actually brings. When you use analog computers and you use circuits now, a uh, uh, that 
uh, 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 takes away a lot of those uh, um, uh, delays because bandwidth, when you use, you know, all bands with resistors and capacitors and, and all that, the, the, the only delays that you have, well, you, you have the delays of the electrons going through, and that's not going to matter. That's in nanoseconds, who cares? But the delays of the actual controllers, the kind of filters that you put in to actually do that, the, what, the effect of an integrator versus a low-pass filter versus a phase, a, uh, a, 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 a high-pass filter versus a, a lead lag or a lag lead, a, or a PI controller, that will, that will a, um, the effects of that is something that you need to understand from a what is the bandwidth of the control loss. And by do, what you do in an analog system is you actually do a frequency response in the open loop way and figure out what is the phase. The frequency of a pilot flying is typically half a hertz. Uh, the 200 milliseconds that I presented is, a, is addressed at, at a half a hertz or a, a three radians per second. Uh, and uh, the, the analysis that you do would be that the frequency response is what is my phase loss of the control loss in an analog system at, at um, three radians per second or half a hertz, uh, and then uh, you, you calculate the time delay based on the uh, the the, um, the 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 the, um, the bandwidth, the, the phase, and the and the time that you're doing by giving you the frequency. I mean, the time and the frequency that you're using by giving you the the phase and, and vice versa. You, you basically a uh, omega is phase divided by t by time delay, and then you do the algebra to get your time delay. It is, it gives you a lot less headache. But the disadvantage that you get, and that may be minor for you, if you use electronics, use op amps, and all that, is that it's harder to change a, uh, from one day to the other. You can actually go and, and do changes in software within an hour and go fly. To do that in a circuit is a little bit more difficult. A, uh, but it may be beneficial to so a, uh, a, 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 if electronics would be very fast to to actually do or within constraints I would use electronics before software it gives you getting into software gives you some some a uh, lower a, uh, so, so some complications that, that you may not want to get into for this competition but be aware that if you need to actually do failure monitoring a, uh, it, you may want to have a computer on the side to actually do that, uh, if, if possible. Great, thanks. And then, uh, can you talk a little bit about failure modes? Uh, do you need to keep flying? Uh, is landing safely adequate? What What happens if something goes wrong? So that, that's a determination that you do when you actually do the safety assessment. A, uh, so, it, uh, it, like, like for example, if you have a, 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 a an aircraft that has eight thrusters and one of them fail. Uh, you still have two to go. So you can actually, uh, the first thing that should come into your mind is like, what, uh, how, do I, how did I get there? Why did that fail? It, it could be, I mean, you, th these flights are very small. I mean, very, very, for, for the go flyer, going to be not, not that long of a, of a flight, a, a program. So uh, you, have, you are going to be getting into the reliability world what, a, what is called in the reliability world informal mortality of a component and of a design, a, uh, which is you were, as engineers and as inventors, you are human, therefore we can err. A, uh, and, and, and that informal mortality a, 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 is what uh, component failures a, uh, occur. The common mode failure has to do about a failure that if one has, it's a design flaw that all of them will have. Uh, and, and then you have to address a, uh, on, on how the failure represents itself. If it's a single failure, you can continue. If you have eight thrusters, you can continue to go. But if you get a second failure, and it's the same kind of failure, I, 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 in my mind, I would say land immediately or as soon as practical. A, uh, the, don't, don't land in the middle of, of, of icing water. Go and find a little land if you can. But you land as soon as practical because that is the behavior of a common mode failure. You don't know when the next one is going to do. A, uh, so that, that's a, a, a really good question because it's a teeter-totter kind of thing. You have to make assessments as an engineer and then as a pilot as well of, of how you're going to treat that failure. But that is why I specifically use the words, uh, make sure that you, uh, that, that you design within the constraints of how the component was designed. Because most of the time what, what, what makes a common mode failure is the use of a component beyond what it was designed for. 
don't don't use a don't use a motor that was designed to be a fixed wing motor uh, while you're going forward and you're hovering and now you don't get the air that is expected to do because you were going at 20 knots or 40 knots or 100 knots. Uh, in here, you may get one knot or zero or zero flow, and now that 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 motor can actually burn. Uh, and, and that gives you, and all eight motors could actually be burning if they were designed to actually get continuous flow of heat, I mean, of air, to actually mitigate the heat uh, and things like that. So it, 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 that one is one experience when you would actually need to talk to an engineer that's in, in, in the flow, and, and I would, I would, uh, I would uh, gladly uh, field questions throughout the process of this uh, through the GoFly network that, uh, if these if these kind of questions show up and uh, and then you're, you're wondering about that, uh, that's something that I can actually as a as a as a master coach can can, can help you with uh, within the constraints of the of the GoFly program. Great, thanks. And then uh, next question is about uh, fiber optic based uh, control systems. Do you have any examples or standards along with using fiber optics for controls? So, so it, I can tell you this, definitely feasible. I, I, the, the program that I told you at the beginning that I did uh, flew for 170 hours and, and, and we had no, no, no failures. Uh, there were some issues with the, with the fiber optics, but the things that are controlled now with no problem. Uh, it, 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 things like the connectors not being right or whatever, all those things actually have been addressed since the, since the 80s. Uh, so first, it's feasible. So, so don't, 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 be, don't be afraid of it. Second, make sure that you do what is called a, a, um, a, a, um, a the analysis of, 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 um, of, of power performance. You, if, that if you send one watt of wire and you need a quarter watt minimum on the other side, make sure that you either measure out or analyze and actually degrade to some extent. I would recommend 15 to 20% degradation of the total thing to actually have that kind of a margin a, uh, such that you know that when you send a signal, from, from a, uh, a critical signal, a, a, uh, from one side to another side, the signal has a, uh, the, the receiver can actually read it appropriately and it's not going to be, especially if it's a digital signal, that, that, is, that, that you get, you expect a one and you get a zero or, or vice versa, or you have to be, or, or corrupt a, a word a, uh, of information that you have. A, uh, the last thing is make sure that you understand the technology of the fiber that you're using. Make sure that you understand the connectors and the effect of vibration, the effects of, of, of maintenance. Hide the fiber. Make sure that people, that you, you or, or the mechanic cannot step on them. Protect the fiber. Make sure that you understand the bend radius of that fiber. Make sure that you understand that if it's plastic, that you're using the right connector, or, or if it's glass, that you're using the right termini, and that you understand the temperature variations of that because the coefficient of thermal expansion of glass is relatively low, and if you actually put something with metal that is a uh, that is a uh, that is going to be higher than that, the, when they start expanding because it's too cold or it's too thick, things are going to break off. So be, be make sure that you understand the physics of of using the fiber optics. And uh, after that, I, I I think that the components exist today, technology exists today to actually do that. You can you can decide what technology you want to use. You can act, you can use RS four twenty two and put it on the on a physical interface of fiber and, 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 and send and read and, and do all that appropriately and, uh, and just, just make sure that you, as, you address a, uh, the safety aspects and, and, and that you test the, um, the, the, the threshold of, of power. That, that's a really, really important analysis to do, the power margin that you need. Great, thanks. And then uh, next question here is, is it possible to use two controllers for redundancy? Absolutely, just not. This is the interesting thing about it, is that if you actually start putting two controllers, a, uh, I would highly recommend that you ask, that you put a requirement that it, that you under that the that the controller can a um, but there's five versions. Number one, that you know if it if it fails, you need to know if it's failing. If, a, and, and one of the simplest things that you can say, if you say, give me three amps. And it's not giving you three amps within a threshold. So you give three amps, and it give you minus five amps. Uh, that's an obvious. Holy cow! What's going on? So what you do with that is that not only that you can detect a failure because it can actually, uh, if you are using two controllers in one in one motor, for example, uh, or in one uh, actuator, you can begin to uh, add or subtract a um, 
uh, commands and and uh, and it is not done per design that is going to go, uh, cause a loss of control so what you need to detect the failure and then once you detect the failure, if the failure is 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 uh, is driving an, an, a, uh, a a critical a, a a command, then you have to disconnect it. You have to have a way to actually say this needs to be off, and uh, and you know you tell the controller to turn off, and if you trust the controller that it will turn off independently from the failure that it has, or put a a, a a different like a relay or a or a FET or something on the side on the on the on the output side, so you can say, I'm turning you off, buddy. You, I don't trust you, and you can use now the other one. The other thing, too, is that you have two controllers, and one, and then they try to, they, 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 they do not match. You end up with something called Byzantinian redundancy problem. And what that means is that if you, if, if, if you have one, if, if you tell the both controllers to go to three, uh, and one goes to three and one goes to minus two, you, you, you know what it's doing. But if you, can, if, you don't, if you don't have a method to actually say, uh, compare, but you know that one is going to three and the other one is going to seven, the question is, who do I trust? How, how do I know that seven is right? How, so you, you make sure that you understand that if you have a dual redundant controller, that you can actually model or, 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 or detect a, uh, the, the failure when they both are when, when one of them is not sending the same signal as the other that's essential and uh, if, if, if you have a way to to actually a uh, bypass it a bypass both and if that and if you have enough a bandwidth on the on the vehicle and the dynamics say hey I can turn it off for one second and see what happens and they say oh that wasn't it do the other one that's one way not recommended but it is a way a uh, and, and it deals with the dynamics. The, the, the other way is to put a third one that is just passive, it's easier, it's not as complex, but at least it can say, hey, uh, this is not doing, it, it, it's not giving the feedback or it's not giving the command that is expected, so uh, they're differing. And then you can say, oh, the, the third one, the, uh, it's, a, it, it's uh, the simple third one that is not necessarily driving, it's just monitoring the, what it should be is saying, I agree with number one, but I don't agree with number two. So now the centralized computer can actually say, eh, okay, that's the bad one, disengage. Eh, and, uh, and at that point, if you actually do that, then put a third one, you must assure that the configuration management of the wiring is fully followed. Because if you reverse the wires and then now one that is the bad, it will follow the bad one instead of the good one. Eh, uh, and it can have a, uh, issues. But, uh, yes, absolutely, it's possible. In, in, in motor control, when you're actually doing current, you, when you, if you have two controllers, if, especially if you're in the same coil, you're doing what's called some, some, some uh, control, some uh, current some control or flux some, uh, uh, and uh, that, that can begin to play with each other, so you need to control that easily. If they're independent, they have two motors a, uh, connected by a, uh, by a shaft or, or, or you're just playing with each other, just, just you do the thrust. But then you can actually see that a, uh, two controllers controlling the same, the same uh, the thruster, but they're both connect, they're both a, uh, a, have the ability to either be connected to, to actually sum the torque or, or, or sum the thrust. You have to be able to, uh, to recognize the failure and, uh, and, 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 uh, and disconnect which one is, is bad. And, and if there is a way to actually, they can actually play with each other, one goes high and the other is going to go low because of that, you also need to be able to recognize how to control that. It's not as much of a problem depending on the configuration. It's all configuration driven when it comes down to dual control. So just do a little bit of a simulation if, if you can or do quick analysis. Uh, but it's totally uh, uh, viable. Actually, many aircraft out there are flying with simplex and dual controls, uh, uh, and, and it is, it is, we design them that way in certain, some of the platforms that we have. Uh, uh, and it's totally perfect way to do it. You just have to go through uh, the process of understanding the failure modes that exist because, uh, and, and how to manage. Does it meet your requirements? It's about the requirements. I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, uh, is there a safety margin percentage for uh, allowance for elastic limits of parts and materials, things like bolt shear areas and things like that? And 
what percentage above the elastic limit is like a good rule of thumb for safety? I'm trying to understand the question. <laughs> when you say elastic, a, uh, um, um, permanent damage. Permanent damage. The, uh, of the, oh, from a from a structure's point of view, a, uh, so if you do the analysis a, uh, and don't do a test. A 50% margin is a good margin to use by using Hamburg, Hamburg numbers of of the um, of, of the elasticity of the uh, of, of, of the system. Uh, that way, you don't end up to be you don't end up in the plastic side. You never want to be in the plastic side of the of, of the of the structural component. I'm assuming that you're talking about structural side. Uh, the uh, when you're near the when you're near the rotating systems that give you a lot of fatigue. Uh, 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 you know, if you don't want to do the fatigue analysis because it's a little more complicated and really uh, you need a, uh, not only experience but a lot of math. Uh, uh, my recommendation is design for stiffness. Make something that I guess really away from the uh, 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 from, from, from safety from, from transitioning from the elastic mode to the plastic mode. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, and that the margin is, is really really high. If you do a test, and what that is for the specific material, the part and, and the and the and the, uh, and, and the guarantee that the that the metal the, uh, or composite the, uh, the, the uh, manufacturer gives you, well, composite is a little different. You have to do that one at a time because every layoff is different. The, uh, but if you do it, if you do a test, then 50%, you can actually enhance that. You can actually bring down to 20 or even some, sometimes 15% uh, away from the margin of safety. Uh, well, not just the marginal safety. That is what's going to give you the allowable in which you can then cal calculate the marginal safety. Uh, so what I just told you is how to actually uh, uh, calculate what the allowable number is in which you're going to use to actually do the marginal safety. Uh, and if there is a follow-up question on that about what I'm talking about, just follow it to go fly and uh, I'll gladly uh, uh, collect some data and send it back. But uh, I hope that I answered the right question. Great, thanks. Uh, and the next question is, what tabular results for dynamic balancing are within safety allowances? Um, that's, well, f first of all, you're gonna have to put some criteria based on the, on the, on the fatigue and the stress that, that you're gonna have on the fuselage by having a, uh, a, 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 a several, or, let's say several elastic or, or elastic modes of the vehicle. Uh, I think the criteria, uh, it, 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 it may not be as stringent uh, as the vibratory side, but it contributes enormously uh, to do that. If you have, <clears throat> A structure in which a uh, thrusters are actually bending a uh, this a uh, the, the model the, the, that drives you to having to do a fatigue analysis. <clears throat> and if you can use a uh, if you can use a uh, a um, handbook calculate handbook estimates for the particular metal or the particular material that you're using. A, uh, I, I would say really below those numbers. I, I go even be, beyond 20%. I will go to 50% as well a, uh, in, into w being away from the plastic mode. A, uh, it, it's basically a similar, a similar uh, answer to the, to the previous question a, uh, because the, what, what, what the, what, what, what the um, a, uh, elastic movement of the structure that is given because of the fly, the aerodynamic and or the a model response of the vehicle from an aerodynamic point of view or, or model response because of an actuator movement or thrusters movement a, uh, is, 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 is from the material point of view, it's not, it, it doesn't care, it doesn't know where it's coming from. It just knows that it's moving a, uh, in a in a in an elastic way, and if you actually don't do the the, the fatigue analysis to understand what is the a working curve, to actually say I need to I need to move away from this a uh, from this um, a number that, that the probability of failure now increases in terms of how, how when the when when the material is going to fail a, uh, in a catastrophic way, meaning breaking a, uh, 
is, is, is essential. That, that, that's a question whose answer is you need to do some science, heavy duty science to that, or stay away from a, uh, you know, from from the uh, from a market, from, a, uh, from, from being close to a uh, to can actually a, uh, do those tests are expensive. A, uh, so the, unfortunately, the, the the designing for stiffness brings weight a, uh, because now you're putting something very stiff, a, uh, and, uh, and stiffness is going to give you that. So a, um, a, uh, that, that, that's a seek for an engineer that can help you with that. Great, thanks. Uh, and then, given the hope for a potential flying vehicle in the future to be able to carry people who might be different weights and sizes, uh, should the flight controls be adaptive so that they can understand those property changes and know how to operate differently? Yes, the, the, the flight controls will will adapt to to that. The, the structure is more important, and the and the and the CG change is more. Is more important to that. So let's, they, that 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 question is multifaceted. So, from a stability of the vehicle point of view, the the flight controls and or the pilot they, uh, are going to balance the airplane to put the air the vehicle in an attitude in which the airplane or the flight control system or the or the stability system wants the vehicle to be at. So if you put a lot of weight on the right hand side, the flight controls the the, the airplane is going to start going towards towards that side and the flight controls are saying what are you doing there you're moving too much you bring it back so the flight controls inherently specifically the inner loop the the, uh, the the stability control system inside that is controlling the dynamics of the vehicle and the static what we call hover or or static a uh, movement of the of, of the vehicle it will take care of it but what is not going to be taken care of is, is two things one is the movement of the CG and is the CG uh, and is that movement be within the the, uh, the the safety and the stability of, of the vehicle? The the CG versus weight plot is going to be a uh, a uh, driven partly by the control magnitude and the loads in the vehicle. A, uh, a, and and if, if you move the, if if you put a very if you, if you put 600 pounds on one side and, and 100 pounds or 80 or 40 pounds in the other, and now you're making a thruster on the one side that actually or the surface into one side that is going to need a force that is beyond its capability, a, uh, then you need to design for that or put boundaries in the in the a, uh, weight versus CG to say. Uh, don't do that. What I have seen is that it's not just do a, uh, a, a what the aerodynamics a, a, a configuration people do is that they do a CG on the on, on the a, uh, the typical CG plot is in the longitudinal axis. But you could also do a a a, 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 a CG plot for the a, a for the uh, lateral axis, so you can see how much weight latitude you're going to have on each side, so it doesn't a, uh, you don't have loss of control or limitations of the control and hey you put so much on one side that i cannot move it anymore you're going to flip the over so that that, that limit is also a good attitude a, a, to do the other one not that many people do but it's essential depending on what kind of landing gear you hook what have and, and where the cg and the vertical axis is so putting a understanding what the vertical axis a, a cg is where, where is the cg within the uh let's, let's say water, water uh, zero watermark is on the vehicle is, is another one to understand and then control for. That one is an analysis that mo is, is done mostly for landing by landing gear engineers. So when you design your landing gear, a, uh, you know if you if you design tilt it in one way or, or you're moving, it's not just the attitude, but the attitude rate. A, uh, you can uh, you, you can run into trouble by both the rate and the and the amplitude, and then you have to assess by simulation a, or by analysis a. Um, what are the limits that you need to put in, in, in weight distribution? And I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, have been on an, even on an airline that at, uh, before you fly, the, the attendant comes in, the pilots ask us to move everybody to the back or everybody to the front. Uh, I, as a private pilot of a small airplane, do it all the time uh, uh, as a matter of I have to. Uh, even airliners go through that too. 
uh, the key is to understand the CG and then the and then go to the flight controls engineer and the aerodynamics engineer to tell you whether you have enough that if you have that own balance in the CG, whether you can actually have control margin to control not just leaving the airplane in that position, but bringing it back and stabilizing it. Great, thanks. So we're almost out of time. So just one more fun question. Uh, what are you most excited about, about what might come out of the Go Fly 5? Oh my, so a, um, I, I answered that in, 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 a, in, a, um, in, in, in a while ago, and the, um, the Go Fly, in my mind, the Go Fly con contest, in my mind, is actually not opening the door because the door has been opened by actually with the distribution of all these uh, 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 toys that the new next generation is actually getting exposed to and getting familiar with and getting a uh, so when they when when they get, when the kids that are 17 years old and 20 years old uh, working with those things become a, 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 the, the 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 leaders of the future they're going to be used to this kind of technology but what this go fly thing does is actually putting momentum into the te into technology and into the eye and, and, and presenting that technology into the eyes of the public which in today people don't have the knowledge that we technocrats uh, have and, and 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 if we're not technocrats or people that have passion about what we're doing there are people out there that actually say oh my god i'm not doing that i was in a in a in a, in a, in a family gathering uh, this 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 past holidays in which I was talking to a neighbor of my uh, brother-in-law, where I was, uh, and and the person, without knowing who I was or what I did and what I represent and what I what I even do, uh, began the conversation about uh, a, a, a autonomous drivers and autonomous airplanes. And and they were oh, there's no free way that I would ever do that. I don't trust them or whatever. And I went, you know, I had to like make a decision: do I do I say something or whatever? And I just smiled because the. Uh, well, what 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 I know is number one: if we we need to address that public concern, this will not a uh, the, 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 what we're trying to do is not going to succeed unless there is public acceptance. Go Fly is going is pushing not only technology, but it's put is is enhancing the momentum to actually get public trust. And developing technology, with their own possible configurations, we develop innovative ways to actually do vehicles that the population can use, not just uh, sitting in, a, in an airplane that is going to go uh, uh, totally autonomous, but it's going to give you the capability that I have with my bicycle and my car and my motorcycle. I can go wherever I want. If I want to go from 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 where I live to to I uh, live in in the, in the Philadelphia suburbs and I want to go and fly over the Valley Forge Park because I want to see how the snow went there uh, two days before and I was a totally uh, thing. I can go and I, the same way that I can drive now I can do before. I cannot do that with a with a with, with, with telling a uh, American Airlines or Delta fly up fly me over there. I cannot do that a, 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 with <clears throat> a, a with by hiring somebody and that is exciting. That is that 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 is a, an amazing thing that the Go Fly can actually bring. Great, thanks, Fernando. We appreciate it very much. And to close us out, I'll pass it back over to Gwen for just the last word. Well, Fernando, all of us—I know I speak for all of us when I say thank you so very much for your incredibly informative master lecture. We truly appreciate the ability to be able to listen to you and learn from you and from all of us at GoFly and all of our over 1,800 innovators worldwide, we say thank you very much. Thank you, absolutely, you're welcome. It got me excited about this whole thing even more. And I have passion for what I do and this actually increases my passion. A, uh, into aviation and what I do. So thank you for the opportunity to actually a, uh, present this to, to all of you that are, that are listening. And good luck.